And good evening, barflies and lounge lizards, and welcome to the Atomic Snack Bar. And tonight we'll be discussing five of my favorite sci-fi robots from the 1950s. And number five on the list is the Colossus, a.k.a. Jeremy, from the Colossus of New York from 1958. And the Colossus of New York tells the story of a brilliant young scientist who, after winning the International Peace Prize, gets hit by a truck and killed. His father, also a brilliant scientist, does what any brilliant scientist would do and saves his son's brain, not wanting it to go to waste. With the help of his other son, he then implants said brain into a large, hulking robot body. All is fine at first, but after a year or so has passed, the robotic Jeremy begins to lose his humanity, and then it gets a bit dark. And I know this is kind of a cheat to start off the episode, being that the Colossus is technically a cyborg, not a robot. But since he begins to lose that little part of him that is human, I'm counting it. But this is a great design. Weird and unsettling and almost more akin to Frankenstein's monster than it is your traditional robot. Kind of looks a bit Outer Limits-ish, too. And the Colossus was designed by Charles Gamora and Ralph Jester. Gamora, sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, was a makeup artist and actor, and he was a true unsung hero of the suit acting world. Not only did he play the alien from I Married a Monster from Outer Space, he portrayed a gorilla on film over 50 times, earning him the very official title of King of the Gorilla Men. Not to mention he played the Martian in War of the Worlds. Jester, on the other hand, had a rather small resume, but did work on the costumes in the Ten Commandments. Now, the suit actor for the Colossus was former circus performer turned actor Ed Wolf. Wolf, who stood at an impressive 7 foot 4, also played the robot in the Phantom Creep serial, a mutant in Invaders from Mars, and wore the fly costume in Return of the Fly. Now, the Colossus costume was around 8 feet tall and weighed 160 pounds. It would take Wolf nearly 40 minutes to climb in and out of the costume. So a special rack was built, allowing him to rest between takes without having to take off the suit. And then we have Ross Martin, who, as to be expected, played the living Jeremy and voiced the Colossus. Martin is probably best known for his role on the Wild Wild West in the 1960s. And number four on the list is Chani from Devil Girl from Mars from 1954. And Devil Girl from Mars tells the story of a sharp-dressed alien commander from Mars who was sent to Earth to get some men folk to help with Mars's declining male population. And she just happens to show up with her robot sidekick, Chani. And Chani is a fantastic design, large and lumbering and a bit sleeker than robots typically were at the time. Chani stood at around 10 feet tall, almost like a giant remote control, with a light bulb head for good measure. Chani was designed by cinema photographer and special effects artist Jack Whitehead. Whitehead has about eight special effects credits to his name, some of which include the 1944 time travel film Time Flies, as well as the 1935 film Transatlantic Tunnel, which starred Richard Dix. And on a totally unrelated but worth mentioning note, Dix would also star in the film noir The Whistler, directed by the great William Castle. But back to Chani and Chani's suit actor. Supposedly, and this is a big ol' supposedly early in the episode, but supposedly Chani was fully automated and suffered from constant breakdowns during filming. Personally, I land on the person in a suit side of this great mystery. I think Chani being automated was just a fun rumor put out there to hype up the film. But because of this, I was able to find zero information, not even rumors, of who might have been inside the suit. Regardless, still a great design. And though Chani doesn't get much screen time, when he's on screen, he is truly the standout character of the picture. And number three on the list is the mummy fighting robot from the Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy from 1958. And the Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy tells the story of a mad scientist who has his sights set on an Aztec treasure, as most of them do. But wouldn't you know, said treasure is guarded by an Aztec mummy. So the nefarious Dr. Krupp builds himself a robot to battle the mummy. And though a very short scene, battle the two do, and it is pretty spectacular. I won't give away the victor, though. 
And this is a truly great robot design. Squared off and boxy, this is exactly what I look for in a robot. But what makes him really stand out is the clear human face you can see within the head. So I guess technically it's another cyborg and another cheat for the list. But hey, if you wanted a competent host, you'd probably be watching another channel. Information is a bit scarce on this one. I couldn't find who designed the robot nor who built him. But the suit actor was an Aldolfo Rojas, mispronunciations abound, and this is his only credit, which is listed as the human robot. And though you can see the actor's head inside, with the robot's unusual size, they did a good job of making it look like the human head was just contained within, rather than a guy in a suit. And just an interesting tidbit about the film itself, one I didn't know until after the fact, but this was the third part of a series of mummy films. And the first half of the movie is basically just a recap of the first two movies. I just thought it moved at a really quick pace. But the series would go on to have a very loose crossover with the Wrestling Women series in The Wrestling Women vs. The Aztec Mummy. And on that, we should take a break. Marshall, he just stuck up the bank. He's headed for Deadwood. You'll never get away with this, Slippery Sam. Marshal Bob is riding Blaze, the fabulous new galloping horse from Mattel. See, his legs actually move just like a real horse. There's no other riding horse anywhere that gallops like Blaze. Now watch this. When you bounce on Blaze, he romps along like a frisky coat. He gallops when you rock back and forth on him, but he's so safe you just can't tip over. Blaze is the safest, strongest horse made. Okay, Slippery. This is the end of the line. Almost got away, Marshal, if it weren't for that light and fast horse of yours. Where'd you get him? You can get Mattel's Blaze wherever toys are sold. And just wait till Dad sees how easy it is to set up. Just pop him out of the box, spread the stand, and tighten just one bolt. That's all there is to it. And see how safe and solidly built Blaze is. You can tell it's Mattel. It's swell. And we're back with number two on the list, and that's The Roman from Robot Monster from 1953. And this is yet another cheat, being that he really isn't very robot -y and nowhere do they establish any robotness in the film. But I don't care. It's my list, and there was no way I could leave off this charming anti hero and ladies' Roman. But Robot Monster tells the story of our titular hero, Roman Extension, XJ2, as he comes to Earth to destroy humanity and rock a mighty fine bubble machine. I mean, no big thing. But he ends up falling for one of the few remaining humans left alive, and thus begins the greatest love story of the 1950s. Now let's talk about that amazing design. One of the best examples of kitchen sink filmmaking to be seen. A gorilla suit, more on that in a moment, and a space helmet. Then, of course, there's the iconic movie poster version with the skull beneath. Though that never actually appears in the film, it's just as iconic an image as the Roman proper. Another interesting little tidbit about the movie poster, it states Moon Monsters launch attack against Earth. Yet, the Roman is not from the moon. The Roman suit was, in part, designed by famed gorilla actor George Barrows, who was also the suit actor, and of course that part being the gorilla portion of the suit. Barrows built the suit himself and wore it in several films, including Gorilla at Large and The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini, as well as TV shows such as The Beverly Hillbillies and The Addams Family. Originally, Robot Monster director Phil Tucker intended the Roman to be much more robotic, but the budget would not allow for this. So he got his buddy Barrows to bring over his gorilla suit, a space helmet was added, and voila, a Roman, Tick Lead, was born. And no, that joke will never get old, nor will I ever stop making it. And the Roman would go on to appear in several different pieces of media, including Looney Tunes Back in Action by 1950s sci-fi film fan Joe Dante, as well as a costume-only shot in an episode of Power Rangers Zeo. And before we get to number one, we should do an honorable mention. And that's Mogera from The Mysterians from 1957. And he was actually even on the original version of this episode. But I just could not find the footage anywhere to feature him. And number one on the list is what I'm sure you've all guessed already. 
But that's Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet from 1956. And the absolutely groundbreaking Forbidden Planet tells the story of a starship crew arriving on a distant planet where a previous expedition had landed 20 years before. The original expedition has gone radio silent, and this new crew has been sent to find out what has happened. But once there, they find that only one of the scientists, along with his daughter, still remain. And with said scientist and his daughter is the bot of the hour, one of, if not the most iconic robots of all time, Sir Robert the Robot Esquire. Sleek and black and oh so smooth, Robbie was like nothing else at the time, and he was designed by several different members of the MGM art department. Special effects artist Arnold Gillespie, who worked on The Wizard of Oz, writer Irving Block, and art director Arthur Longerun provided the initial concepts and sketches. From there, Robbie went to the hands of production illustrator Mentor Huber for further refinement. Huebner also worked on King Kong 76, Blade Runner, and The Time Machine. And finally, our bubble-headed friend was finalized by MGM mechanical designer Robert Kenosha. Kenosha also worked on Tobor from Tobor the Great and the B-9 from Lost in Space. And though it was certainly a team effort, it's probably safe to say that Robbie wouldn't be what he was if it hadn't been for Kenosha. There were actually two suit actors for Robbie, diminutive stuntmen Frankie Darrow and Frankie Carpenter. Darrow was also an actor with appearances on Alfred Hitchcock Presents, The Phantom Empire, and Batman 66. According to Forbidden Planet lead Anne Francis, Darrow was let go from the production fairly early on for showing up drunk and nearly falling over in the Robbie suit. Had it not been for three grips catching him, he would have hit the ground, possibly damaging the expensive suit. And speaking of, segue, Robbie cost around $125,000, a very expensive prop for the time, equaling millions of dollars today. Robbie alone made up almost 7% of the film's entire budget. And he wasn't the easiest to prepare either. To get into the suit, the three sections were dismantled and the suit actor climbed into the legs. The torso was then added and secured, and the operator was strapped in. Finally, the head was connected to the suit and the hidden power cables within. Robbie would go on to appear in many films and TV shows, including Dobie Gillis and Lost in Space, but one of the most interesting was his appearance in the 1957 film The Invisible Boy, where it is implied that he was the exact same robot from Forbidden Planet, having traveled through time. Both official Robbies were voiced by actor Marvin Miller. Miller did numerous on- and off-screen roles, including narration on The Deadly Mantis and voiceovers for Invasion of the Astro Monster and Gamera the Invincible. And that's all the time we have for this week. Don't worry if I failed to mention some of your favorites. This is an ongoing series, and the sequel episode has already been released. And yeah, it features Gort. So please like, comment, subscribe, watch the skies, and stay atomic. Mm -hmm.